Hi, I'm David Anderson. This is the Timex Sinclair Online User Group. And tonight we have a special guest, George Grimm from Timex. And I say Timex because George started at Timex, the watch company. And then when the Timex Computer Corporation was formed, George worked for the Timex Computer Corporation. And then after the Timex Computer Corporation went away, George continued to work for Timex. Um, <clears throat> George had a uh, unique role at the Timex Computer Corporation. He was a software manager. So um, <clears throat> when people sent in software for consideration, George was the, the organizer of that, that process. Um, <clears throat> there was a document that was put out for the 2068 called the Third Party Software Programmer's Guide. And on the last page was a form that you would fill out if you were going to submit some program for Timex. Uh, and George was the person that that went to. So with that, George, I am going to turn it over to you and spotlight, replace spotlight. There we go. There you are, George. Uh, oh, thank you, David. And I feel over. I feel wonderful to be here. I tell you, how <laughs> everybody gets the time travel back and uh, go back forty years? Yeah. And, and was, I know Dan said he was surprised that there were still people interested, but that doesn't surprise me any because when people like something, they stick with it. And I, well, I watched a lot of your other ones, and it looks like I have a lot of hardware guys out here who took the machine apart and made parts better. Uh, I'm not a hardware person at that time. In 1982, I, I I didn't do any hardware. I didn't even know what a microcomputer or mini computer or any kind of computer looked like in 1970 when I started as a COBOL programmer. Learned some Fortran and another assignment, PL1, Nomad. And then I ended up one of the only IT guys up on the third floor of our corporate headquarters in Connecticut. I was the only one up there because I had worked pretty intensively with most of the VPs on a little dispute they had with the government. And uh, they kind of like to have me around. They ask questions. And I have a little lab. I was the only one in it. And uh, as, as uh, Fred Olson, he, of course, he owned Timex. He uh, was a very down to earth type of person. He'd walk right in there. He'd, I was working with modems or acoustic thing. I have no idea what I was doing, but he dropped in front of me uh, this black box, spec from ZX81. And he said, can you think you could make this work before I leave back for Norway? And uh, my boss quite raced in behind him. What's he doing there? <laughs> Gotta get me fired. But uh, that's how I got in it. I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I did, yes, I wrote software. Don't get me wrong, I've written software now for 12 years, but I was going to write basic for the first time, I guess. And I, we didn't have a manual, but somebody dug one up from the ZX world, uh, wrote some code, didn't have the RAM pack yet. But uh, the real energy came from my boss, and I just wanted, I'm not going to mention a lot of names or a lot of timelines, but my boss's name was Billy C. Skirm. And he put the action in things. When he came in, things happened. And he was the director of IT. And uh, he came in, intercepted the conversation between me and Mr. Olson, and made a lot of promises. They looked the machine over. Oh, it's only 1K. They had no idea what 1K was. But they, they, they got to make it 2K. That was what America wanted, 2K. So... We didn't know how to, hey, we're looking at the bottom. I'm not, thinking, I'm not going to open it up. But anyways, it, it lasted a couple of weeks. I had a little basic program running on. Fred came back again. Okay, now I hear we're going to we're going to make it in the U. Uh, we're going to sell it in the U.S. Timex did not make or design or have anything to do with this computer. We were just going to market it and. As Dan, Dan said the other night, we were mass marketers. We had, we were going to sell so many of these computers. We had one third of the watch business. Well, we're going to have at least that much of 
home computer for $99. But, you know, we had to make it work first. And the first step was to get ready for CES in Chicago. We had to have 2K machines. We didn't know how to get them. I think we, we did bring a gentleman in who made who burned us an EEPROM at 2K. And the new ROM was on it. And he changed it to, when it booted up to say Timex Sinclair ZX81. I finally got a RAM pack. And uh, I put the RAM pack on the back and fell off immediately. Uh, and it would always fall off. Uh, so I had taken a number two pencils and tore the eraser heads off and stuck them down there and made a wedge. And hey, Timex, they saw that. Yeah, we'll take care of that. But that's how I had to keep it together. And uh, the timeline was now approaching that we were either going to go to CES or not. We had a 2K chip now in there. We could turn it on. We had no software that was worthwhile presenting. So I wrote the budgeteer, the very first piece of software that I wrote for the machine was to keep track of your home budget. Remember Danny said, we were gonna do games. God help it, my games were terrible, but we were gonna do businesses, homes. So I wrote the budgeteer and states and capitals. And you, I gave it to state and you had to type in the capitals and I did like a mid left right compared to text, correct or not. We had those two programs. We went to CES in Chicago. And I had to get it all set up. Oh, my God, were they going to even work? It was pretty successful for us there. Uh, and I can't remember if Dan was on board at that time, but I think we went to CES Chicago first, and then we took it to the Tavern on the Green in New York City. And I know Dan was there then, but so was George. And George was the one that set the computers up, and then up into the shadows and Dan, of course, did the sales pitch. So that was my role, really, was I was all about the program. I was all over the program. And uh, we didn't have any programs. And I had no programmers. I only had people downstairs who wrote BAL360. I was trying to teach them PL1, but they only knew BAL360. Couldn't pull anybody up. They were all older than me. And I was 32. They, they were just not, so I hired a young fella. Oh, he wore jeans into the corporate office the first day he showed up. And, this, and you know, everybody said, David, I said, David, you, you can't get dressed like that here. Oh yeah, I don't have any other clothes. But so, but David was a pretty good guy with hardware, not so much, but software and he knew Z Z8. But he didn't last long because he just couldn't stand the, formality of that world, you know, eight to five, uh, suit and tie, Friday was casual day, he was casual every day. So David lasted maybe a month, and he went on to work somewhere up in Boston. Now we still needed a hardware guy or a Z80 guy. We, there were no other programmers at this time, just me. I had now written maybe four programs, and we got a guy who wrote in Z80. And he was able to go in there and look around and give us some specs and some ideas. And uh, we went to CES, came back, and we had orders supposedly for 600,000 machines. <laughs> we have four. That's the time Nick Sinclair on it. So uh, it was a hustle. And we went to the, the Tavern on the Green in, in the same way that we went to Chicago with the same machines and two pieces of software, one being the budgeteer and the other being states and capitals. And uh, I never spoke at that time. I was just there to make sure they ran. And I didn't really want to speak because these guys were all marketing. And Dan was all marketing. And I know he was there and he had, we had more marketing people than we had people who made the watches. So anyways, the first two guys left and we were looking like, well, how is George going to write 700 pieces of software. And I, you know, I was raised in a small town. I was in the army. I got around a little bit. Then, it's still a small town. It's in New York like everybody else. But then all of a sudden into the parking lot one day comes this big Mercedes with the kind when you open it up and shut it off, the thing settled down on its own and out steps this blonde with a long mink coat on. Comes walking down the walk, comes in the building, asks for me, 
I go to her up, she says, hi, I'm Sue Courier from Sloth Inc. I hear you're marketing the ZX Spectrum here under your own branding. I've got the software. And whew, Sloth Sync to the rescue. And we've formed a lifelong friendship, but that's how we got so many titles. Dan mentioned cottage industry. She already had an industry and connections into, well, she knew Nigel Cyril quite well. And she could get all the techie facts that she ever wanted. And she she just funneled all her software up to us. It was already debugged, checked, boxed. What we do is change it over. And we had a master copy. She had a lot of stuff. It still wasn't great stuff at that time, you know, but who knew? That that looked great to us because there was nothing else to compare it to. Like we didn't look back on that. <laughs> but SoftSync brought us software and sue was on the phone with me daily and then we had this open up thing where we announced to the what looked like a fairly large zx audience already in the united states it's people who played with the thing it was flooded with software we had people with plumbing ideas yard improvement home improvement algebra geometry calculus there were all kinds of subject matter coming in and uh, it was getting pretty obvious that I couldn't review them all. <laughs> so uh, it was a slow process. We got 16 titles out at the time we started actually shipping the, the computers. We had 16 titles, probably half of them that I wrote, and they were all just in basic. Uh, the rest of them, they looked pretty good. I did nothing wrong with states and capitals, but I had spelled Tallahassee wrong in some end user did. Got a hold of me and I had to change it. But that was what I call the birth, you know, the birth of this thing. Uh, and it, it, along that birth, you know, uh, Dan and Billy, they were busy and popular science wanted to get their hands on a machine. But they had they had ads in the back of their book for ZX. So they, not, they wanted to see the Timex and Claire. Neither one of them wanted to go to New York that day to deliver, deliver on the ZX Hindux Sinclair. So I drove them. And guess what? I was in that building with Popular Science and the editor Bill Hawkins came out. He wasn't just gonna let me deliver. I had to set it all up one. Put it all together, get it running. And then he had all his artistic team come in. They weren't gonna put it on the cover. And he's asking me questions. Somebody's writing all my answers down. And he said, This television. We need a yellow television. When do you find a yellow television? A kid leaves, comes back in 20 minutes with a yellow television. And that's that's what's on the cover here. This yellow TV, I didn't bring that one with me. I had a black and white, he, you know, a regular TV. He found in New York City a yellow television because it was going to be the colors. So I got my name all over that, 15 minutes of fame. I go back to the office and he said, how'd it go? Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> so they were sorry they didn't go because most of the time I was not in the forefront of process. That time was my my chance, and it went over pretty well, I think. And uh, we were we were busy. We we shipped 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 out of our Torrington warehouse, truckload after truckload of ZX of the Timex and Flair one thousands. And the RAM pack, okay, that was an issue. And the tape recorder, this was a monumental task. This was not working. You could save it off. You have a better than a 50% chance it wasn't going to reload. So I started looking for tape recorders, and it was a radio shack up the street. And I went into this young fellow behind the counter who was the manager, I thought, we, we need a cassette player. Maybe it has some pictures on it. Like a little hole I heard down by here, and I can stick a jeweler's screwdriver down there and tune the, what I thought was the word was azimuth. I don't know what the, I could tune it like this and watch the bars on the screen. I could get those bars nice and black and could load every time. So I brought that thing back and I had one. And Billy said, you better go back and buy everyone he's got. So we had like 10. I came back with the other nine. And that guy sold more of those Radio Shack models 
than any other radio shack in the country. But he was only a mile away from us. And he had enough money to take his wife. He won an award, took his wife. And that one store, of course, it populated. I think everybody used that tape recorder because you could adjust the app. But that wasn't that wasn't for the commercial market. That wasn't that wasn't right for a person who never touched the computer before, tinkered with one. You know, the Brits, they could take apart an MG and put it back together because that's what they had to do. Right, in America, it, it was it was the beginning of the turnkey era. You turn it on, it's supposed to work. And the, this little guy, you know, what's the challenge? So the ZX81, uh, I keep on calling it that because I keep on seeing the pictures. But Timex Sinclair 1000 was very popular. It was being shipped. Everybody in the building, of course, wanted one to take home too. But a lot of them came back. And I'm not going to go on for every, every detail, but a lot of them started to be returned. And, you know, let's say over the next year, probably out of the 600,000, a lot of them came back. People couldn't work it. They're still getting a lot of software. Lots of software were coming in. And then Clyde came out with the Spectrum. This was hopefully going to be an answer but, uh, you know, it was nice, simple keyboard, color, and the games, the games these young guys could write, young guys and gals could write. And I'm going to mention two people because I thought they were the two greatest people who ever wrote a piece of code on this machine. And you might remember their games. One of them was Sandy White. He wrote Ant Attack. And Sandy White showed the, me and my guys now that I had. I had a little team of people. Yeah, I had a Zilog too. He showed the world that you were not bound by what you saw on the screen. He took this game right across the screen and the rest of it came in on the other side. It was like, it was like a miracle. How could somebody do that? So Sandy White and Ant Attack. And then a guy sent a tape in. Murder Chase. I <laughs> actually like crazy murder. We can't have like what's that called murder. So we called it Mur Death Cycle 2000. But it was right around the Ewok movie for Star Wars. And this guy had these the spikes they were riding zooming through these trees at a speed I'd heard of on a ZX on a, on a Time X and Flare. I mean, it was flying through there. And it was a game of skill. You hit the tree, the, the bike. And those were the two. There was a lot of others, but these two people really knew how to write code on that machine, on that machine. At this time, however, it didn't have what we wanted. We wanted joysticks. How many want joysticks on a business machine, but now they wanted joysticks. And they wanted that because of the tape issue. They wanted that card, cartridge box slot. But to do that, we had to rewrite the ROM. And we had no real skill at that. And of course, not me, but we hired a bunch of people. Now we really built TCC up. We had over 100 people working on it between QC, software, and writing, rewriting the ROM. So I don't want to jump ahead of myself here, but George got a lot of lessons about how things were done in America. And I, I was like, you know, I wrote code. I didn't get out of the world of manufacturing. And I had the cassettes. And I would say, well, we've got to make 900,000 of these. Where well, you put one in and you push the button and you take another one in and you push the button. and you, we, we, we got to make 900,000 of those. So there was a place called Cook Labs. It was down the road, maybe an hour. And I took my masters. I had four or five approved copies. I took them down there expecting to see a bank of these cassette players and people pushing buttons. He had one cassette player. And he put the tape in and he loaded it up to the gigantic reel of Mylar tape. It was gigantic. Maybe 12 feet in diameter. And he loaded it up. And they had what looked like a stack of ammunition boxes stacked up with empty cassettes themselves with nothing to do with plastic. 
and he recorded it on that thing. Well, how many was he going to make? 500. He recorded my program 500 times. Never had to touch a button. It just ran. And then that machine injected that tape into that cassette, cut it, sliced it, spliced it, took it down the ramp and labeled it. Said, oh, boy, this is something. This is something. Yeah, so there was no problem making the cassettes. We used Cook Labs, and they made every cassette we ever manufactured. Amazing, just amazing. And uh, we have people now. I had some of the most talented people who couldn't write a line of code. <laughs> no offense. They were, but they were very talented in playing the, the playing game. And they became very good screeners of software. So that's basically, after I wrote my first 16 things, I stopped because there was no way I was competing with these guys and gals. But I had a good review team, and I they each took the tape of the day, each one of them, and they contacted directly the, the, the author. They'd call him in New Zealand, wherever he was, and they'd work with them. So it was pretty good. It worked out very well. And uh, they were all polite people. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of told them, that, can you change this? Can you change that? And they would do it. Sue was still supplying us with a bunch, but we did have a lot we were getting just from coming in the mail. And we also had an open door policy. You could come to our headquarters and sit in our lobby, and I would come down and look at your cassette tape. You no know, appointment needed. And I met a lot of people locally who had spectrums. Who came in just that way, and they they they, they made seven percent royalty. We were paying a seven percent royalty, and nine hundred thousand tapes, and their piece of the pie was pretty good. Pretty good. So, I met the guy who wrote Lotus One Two Three before he wrote it, of course. But I met him. He came in. You know, he came in unannounced. He flew into the airport nearby in his own private little plane. And he wrote Ducalc. And he later when I went to do Lotus One, Two, Three. Bill Gates came by and I Danny was with him probably more for the upshot of could he port his program into 16K of our RAM. He, he was in negotiation with IBM at that time. But I got the hey, hi, how you doing? Kid, what a kid, you know. But so Bill Gates and those two authors, those two pieces of software. And the spectrum was going to need a new one <clears throat> because you can't put joysticks in. Maybe you guys probably could at that time, but these guys were, yeah, I'll rewrite the ROM. And we were not ever made a circuit board. We never made anything at times. We had no equipment like that, nothing built. We made mechanical watches. We made mechanical watches so long that TI was out with LEDs and the market was getting swept by LCDs, and still, we wanted to make mechanical watches. So in 1980 and 81, when this computer surfaced in 82, we were going to be the salvation of time. We were going to save the company. That was the, a lot of presentations and a lot of stores. I had to go to Macy's more times and just sell the computer myself and show them how to use it. I, I didn't make money on that. I don't know, but it just had to be done. We had to we had to get rid of that return, that heavy return policy. We had to put people in the field trained. And we did. We hired college kids. We trained them. They went out and earned some money. Now we had a massive sales force. And I did get to speak to them one time. I'll never forget it. I spoke for about 45 minutes, went over, of course, the software. And I said, any questions? What what are the points? I I looked at Billy. I said, "What do you mean points? What is the what are the points?" He wants to know what percentage he's going to get when he sells it. Uh, that was so. The marketing people marketed watches. This was a mass market mess, if you want to call it. They just dumped them into the stores, and we paid a heavy price for. Them. I think I think we paid a heavy price for that. We did recover. But the one behind you there, the 2068, was a jewel. It was really a nice little box. Danny had number one instead of the uh, 
Canada Sinclair. And I, I couldn't find my 2068 tonight. I don't know what I did with it. I had one. I, my son called me around four o'clock. I told him what I was doing. He said, hey, I got it. Now you gave it to me. And he went and pulled it out. And I didn't even have a serial number on it. It's a pre-production sample. But that's the one I use. So I said, well, don't. And then he went on eBay and started buying software for it. You're going to try to get it run it. So what, what, what transpires next is the middle ground of the end. And that is, we didn't have any way to make our own anything. We had to go out to Arizona to make the run. First, the first trip, you know, it was a one trip deal. Hey, yeah, we're going to make a run. We're going to put it right in there. The engineers said, we'll be ready in a month. We've got the box, the shells made, cases made. All we got to do is get that. They came back from Arizona, they ran their test, failed. Now they had to wait till the and I, I think I might have been Intel. I can't remember the name of the company. Whoever did this job. Of it. They had to wait a month before they could get another appointment. Back out again to Arizona. Back again. Failed. They couldn't get the ROM right for so long. We had no income. <laughs> we had the cartridges. We had stuff made. We weren't selling anything. They didn't want to sell that chocolate. You know, they wanted to come out with this 2068. And uh, didn't happen. It just never happened. Uh, pretty high up on my morale yet still. Until two o'clock in the morning, we had the fire, and we lost every piece of software we had. It was gone. Burned down the entire laboratory. And this I was in my own building. The gyro industry had been sold before then. Better challenge Danny. Because I was in the gyro part of the building. You weren't allowed to go in there when they had a gyro. But that my, my now my big production office was in. And we had a fire. My desk, the little steel gray one, was that high. Melted. Nothing was left. Every The xylog melted. Everything was melted to the ground. We had no tapes. And now it was easy when the person called. How did my tape do when you review it? Uh, when we had a fire. We got to send it again. I didn't have to give them the bad news. So that was one benefit. But we went back and we got some more 2068s. And we were probably in the conference room for a couple of months. And then uh, money was running out. And uh, my Billy came down to me on a Friday. And he said, it's going to be close. We have one last guy who's looking. Duncan Dunk. <laughs> Dan didn't mention that. And that could be a fictitious story to make me feel good. But Dunkin' Donuts was thinking of investing, running up some capital money. And he came down Monday and he said the deal fell through. You want the good news or the bad news? I said, I'll take the bad news first. Everybody, all 107 of us, are gone. You leave today. You, however, get to stay because they're in trouble with customs again. They want you back down in court. So that's the only reason I stayed. But all of them marched out. And they knew it was coming. And that was the end. We never got that thing to we never got that thing to mark. We never got it. If it, if if you if anybody got it, we turned our blind eye and I know Portugal got heavily involved. And other entities grabbed up our stock, our rights or whatever they needed. They might have made it happen. I just, just cut it off. I shut it off. That was the end of the problem. End of problem. And uh, I had a great time. Three years of pure excitement. You don't get that much on a job uh, working for a corporation, but three years of front, the front line activity, shows, demonstration, blah 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 blah. So I do thank my lucky stars on that one. Uh, not mentioning any names except Sue Courier, who I think you might guys should know or you should try to find it, you know. And Billy Skern, who unfortunately passed away at a very young age. But he, and he alone, made that machine in North America happen from a technical point of view. From He did everything but the marketing. He, he wasn't, he was more, he could get that Chuck guy, wrote all our stuff. He got Sue Courier. He got everybody on board that he needed 
to do the job. Cook Labs, everybody, he was that man. And uh, well, I worked with him many years after we were together, but uh, those two names uh, were certainly instrumental in, we had three phases, the rise, the flatlining, and then the fall. And we, we all were, the only ones who didn't get the rise and the flatline were the ROM writers, Scott and his crew, because they came at the end trying to make it work. If we had stayed with the spectrum as it was, we probably could have lasted another six months. But I already bought a Commodore. <laughs> I had a Commodore now, and I was writing Commodore code, code for SoftSync. <laughs> And, and, and I got to tell you, they had sprites and you could move things a lot easier. I'm going to end this with Atari. And the, the game was called Moonraker. I don't know who wrote it, but it, it was the most fascinating graphical thing that I ever saw run on a time exemplar computer. And I called them up and I said, how the heck do you do that? And he said, well, my brother works for Atari. It's a kid, probably was 16 or 17 years old. My brother works for Atari, and we went up in an airplane, and we filmed the horizon at 31 degrees altitude. And we made a video, and that's how we copied the image of the moon rolling over to us. But the characters, they all moved so smooth. Everything was smooth. The meteorites came out, the tanks, the robot. No jerking. Oh, aren't you writing between the interrupts? Well, <laughs> what the hell? Are, I don't know. I, maybe you guys know what he was talking about. But he said, oh, yeah, we write between the interrupts. When the raster goes from there to here, and before it jumps back, we rewrite the screen. So it's, no, I never heard of such a thing with you for three years. I, not one guy I ever hired knew anything about it. Sorry to about it. And, there, and, and that kid wrote that game. Didn't sell any of them because we didn't get that program, that computer out, but he had the game. Moonraker was by far. And it was it was made into an Atari game too. I think it, it, it was. And it, yeah. So with that, I'm not just thought, I'm not gonna just talk about what I did with my life. After that, I just stayed in programming. I had a couple of companies. I bought an IBM PC and I took the software that customs liked and I made it run under the Turbo Pascal. I couldn't keep up with the printers. Everybody had a different printer. There was no windows, you know, you had to change the print. I said, you know, and I sold it to somebody for $2,000, source code and all. Then I got involved with a Palm Pilot and the, I had a little company there and you, you made money. You just, you just sent it the code and they paid you as it was sold, $75 eight months I was making. And uh, Oracle then came and I learned Pro-C and became a Pro-C expert bar none. And I wrote Pro-C code and Oracle 11i. And I retired at 54 years old. I retired and moved to Florida. Wow. Never to have work again. It didn't last because I couldn't collect on the 59-year-old 401 stuff yet. So now I got the hardware. I went to work for J.C. Penney Warehouses, and I had to build the entire warehouse. I had never been up on one of those jacks, you jack, scissor jacks, that you go up. I had to go up and put routers in, run the cat by. <laughs> I did all the hardware, <laughs> and uh, it got a little bit old for that. So, after eighteen months of that, I went back into the warehouse software side, where I learned symbol scanners. I became the symbol scanner expert in Kuhn and Nagel. <laughs> I could make a symbol scanner do anything to take an inventory. So, and that's how I ended it. But I had a, you know, I, I say I love software and uh, I know I had a good life with it. And I outlived, like at least years, <laughs> still going. I could still write code if I had to and I uh, don't want to, but uh, I write scripts. And I know you guys, and I don't know you guys. I know what, I'd like to hear now uh, what you did with the darn thing, because it's still going. I didn't make it go 40 years. You did. And uh, I did watch some of the videos. What What is? 
<laughs> well, <We're> George, good. <laughs> we have a ton of questions, I'm sure. Yes, be, any questions you want that aren't hardware related, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, okay. Um, one of the one of the that, that was really cool about the the Cook Labs. When you went down to Radio Shack, do you recall which what the cassette player looked like? Was it the same one that ended up? You it ended was up silver, down? and we rebranded it ourselves. Okay, it was silver. Okay, and I don't know where I heard about. Maybe Nigel told me to stick a school of screwdriver down in there. It yeah. didn't come from anybody in Timex for sure. It might have come from Nigel. Nigel would come over once in a while. And, or I could I could have read it yes. because the X Spectrum had the same issue. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny that David mentions that because I'm a real big, particular fan of that cassette deck. So you know, I've I've got a bunch of them from Radio Shack. It's you might remember the name. It's called the Mini Set Nine, right? And it's a little silver, silver? Uh, square, yeah. right? And it looks very similar to the you know the Timex Sinclair 2020, which and obviously I think we painted some of them black. You might have. I've never seen a black one, but um, you know, it seems like everything was going to the silver thing when the when the fifteen hundred and the twenty sixty eight were were kind of in the pipeline, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so I you know I have the I have the mini set nine. I've got a mini set ten actually, which is very similar, and a mini set eleven. But anyway, um, the schematics are a little different. You know, so I guess you guys must have uh, thrown in a few little extra things, maybe, because it was no, no, obviously no. no. I, can t I can tell you that we made watches. Right, right. We we took the whatever Clive put in, we took, and of course, we tried to modify the ROM. But everything else was stock. We left it alone. Radio Shack, we left it alone. We painted some black for pictures. Probably at right. But we, or maybe we masked out that it was a Radio Shack. We called it. Mm -hmm. Sinclair or something, but. but and you know, with that, you have asked, you have answered, you know, one of the great mysteries of, <laughs> <laughs> of Timex Sinclairdom, which is, you know, we were able to deduce that there was a, a cosmetic resemblance, you know, not not just the people here, but you know, other folks over the course of time, um, but uh, you know, and and so we never, nobody knew that 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 was the origin story, shall we say. <laughs> they were a block down the road from our corporate headquarters, and I went there. If I had the front loader, if you wanted to call it, the, the one with the red key on it, and you, you hit, you push down, it was a front loader. I couldn't yeah. get, half the time I couldn't get it to load. So either Nigel told me, or I went to this Radio Shack store, and he had no idea who I was. I was just a customer, and he said, yeah. Well, yeah. And he said, yeah, you put your little screwdriver down, and then you could turn that thing and make the pitch change. I'll try it. And and your and your next moment was I'll take twenty thousand. <laughs> we ordered an awful lot. We 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 gave them the, a gateway into our I think our I think our pipeline. Yeah right right. So we made it, we made them aware. We made the customer aware that such a thing existed. Let's put it that way, and they could get one for whatever <laughs> it was. I had no idea at that time. Twenty five dollars maybe. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the funny stories that you told me when we were chatting over email a while back was about writing <clears throat> Grimm's fairy trails. And I repeat this to people just because I find it hilarious. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, writing that program and, you know, where the names came from and this, sort of what your inspiration occurred, was? This occurred because I, I couldn't write assembler language. And I knew these people who were writing it. And I said, I want to learn assembler language. I want to learn Z80 assembler. So this was written with the help of a guy named Bob Beeler. And uh, he, he was the one that taught me to load register. And we had to have, we, with the, and I know you guys, I'm not, there was a key called poke on the keyboard, right? Yeah. And I had to poke in each, whatever, every command, letter by letter into that through that key and then you write it. so i ended up writing that whole thing at night in my house over a period of a month and i named all the characters after what i'll call the, the founders and they were in pursuit of the sacred stone of ross <laughs> within the center you had to get to the center of the maze and uh you on your way you could collect little power pills called beelers 
and Murph and Drago were the bad guys. You, they chased you. It was like Pac-Man. Murph and Drago, Carlos Dragovich and Margot Murphy. And Prince Billy was the hero. And so I and Billy just was adamant that he it was got that was the name we were going to call that piece of sauce. And I, I, my son bought a copy tonight. He had to pay twenty five dollars for it. I had him for you know I had all that stuff when I left. So he says, "What well, you should have it." And he bought it on eBay for twenty five bucks. It was eight dollars. Twenty five dollars. So he's going to oh well, I have grandchildren. It'll get lost again. You go out on eBay twenty years from now. So that's the story of that one. And it, I cut some mileage out of it. I got a little cred. I got a little bit of credibility. Didn't last long. I don't know if you ever remember the one where the foot came down and stopped you. A big, gigantic foot like a Monty Python. Yeah. And go, you know, these guys were really good. <laughs> I, I said, oh, yeah. My, my little two-dimensional maze is quickly being <laughs> supplanted. And the, I, guess, I guess they just had plenty of time to tinkle with that stuff because their stuff was... There was ant attack with them with the amazement. We were we were mesmerized by some. I wrote one called the Guardian. Oh, I had, I had a naval destroyer, and I had I had a gentleman working for me who was from Taiwan, and you know in those days you had to have a green card. Mm -hmm. So he came to Timex and went to HR, and they said, "Do you have a green card?" He said, "Yes," but I didn't bring it with me. Oh, okay, no problem. You know, so he's down in my office, and he stayed down there for like eight, six months. And he wrote the routine where the where the missile comes up and ha it, it hits an arc. And he wrote that in, in Z80, and I incorporated it into my basic program: a push button and hit launch missile. So he got away with eight months of working without a green card. Finally, they caught up with him and. He said, don't worry, this is how we get into this country. I'll go to work for another company, maybe down in Greenwich Village down there. And we all really work for a guy in New York. We pay him. And he pretends that we're his employees. So after five or six years, we got a green card. Uh, and it was weird, weird, weird time. I couldn't understand, uh, but he was a nice kid. So that's how that uh, Rims Ferry Trails was. I learned Z80 from Bob Beeler. And uh, gave him a name in there too, the Beelers. Uh, George, I have, I have a question. Get away you. with it. Uh, you talked about a minute ago about programming it and uh, poking everything in in basic. Was everyone programming in assembly language or in machine language in that method, or did some people have a way to actually program in assembly language and assemble their program, or was it all handwritten and hand assembled? We were all programming for the Sinclair. Yeah, just in basic. Mostly in basic. Uh -huh. Yeah, but when you said you programmed um, the some machine language routines for Grimm's Fairy Trails in machine language, right? Or that was a hunt. I had the loader was in basic, and then I loaded in. I forgot how it actually all worked as far as you get it in, but I think they wrote the loader in basic. Two little things went up and yanked up the code. Okay, and it was all assembly. I was the only all assembly because I I could not get that little thing to go across the screen, and it was so slow. Mm -hmm. And he looked at you can't write a program like that in basic. And now what I then I had to put a slowdown in it. <laughs> and it was too fast. And I there was so many talent. I was telling the kid, I don't know, he could have been 12. He's on the phone with me. I said, How do you write that game? How do you move all those characters around? He says, We use a wheel. Don't you use wheels? I said, What? He says, Yeah, you don't go check to see if register six has got a black in it or a white in it and then reverse it you just go around and do it and you don't and this way here everything moves at the same speed if i fire a missile I move, the missile doesn't just move and hit and then i go to the next routine like i was writing it it moves a fraction and he jumped in and, that, and this and this and this and this and this and, this. and so it was, he just continually executed the same loop over and over and over and of course it's hard was doing that loop between the interrupts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they had they had some obviously they had some skill they they had skill where, well, where too, well too adam i think along with what george is saying i think you know the, with the cottage industry they you know a lot of smart guys out there made you know disassemblers and assemblers for you know the the zx81 and the 1000 
and yeah, right. vice versa yeah. for the 268. So that's kind of started, uh, you know, I think, you know, folks starting to program in assembly language directly on these Timex machines, right, through other people's software that they were making for assembler to some assemblers. But I sense. think in the beginning, yeah. yeah, I think in the beginning, like George was mentioning, if you wanted assembly language, you had to like write in a RAM statement and poke it all into RAM, right? And then you would call yeah. it. That's kind of how I think in the beginning, it seemed most of this machine language stuff was I, done. I wrote every instruction down on a piece of paper in case I, I lost it. I'm not going to try to figure out my logic anymore. <laughs> that book's like, well, that's not that thick. But it was an arduous task. But that's how I was built for life. I mean, not arduous, but I always did things from the bottom up. When they wanted to do the computer, I, let's turn it on, see what happens. I didn't get into a strategy meeting right then. Well, what are we going to do with it down the road? I just turned it on and plugged it in. Fred was happy. He he now could go and figure out how a way to sell it. But I was working from the bottom up. So I did one bite. I, I changed. I'd run it, a couple of things, and next thing you know, the job is done. Yeah. But that's the only one I ever did. That was way too long. And yes, you're right. They they had other machines. They had they I got I don't know, the Zilogs uh exist before microcomputers. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking about the Zilog development system. Yeah. That, um, I think they had ways of pumping that thing in there without ever going near a, a, a yep. next player. Yeah, you, you could have programmed stuff on the Zilog and put it through the in circuit emulator uh pod the thing that, that that they had to get replaced when lon was talking to us um <clears throat> do you i didn't need, i didn't need any more software so we just stopped writing it we had plenty of software we had all the software the world was ever going to need <laughs> until it burned down we had, that's, we had that's... a lot of good cottage industry and uh what we didn't get from the cottage we got from soup well, yeah. don't sell yourself short there, George, as far as hardware, because, I mean, you kind of mentioned a lot of things, you know, when the Spectrum came out, you know, Timex was, like you said, you know, they wanted joysticks. I don't know who wanted joysticks, but, you know, I, I was kind of theorizing that, yeah, they were looking at the market with, uh, you know, like the VIC-20 was out already and some, you know, some Atari machines and they had joysticks, right? And so I don't think Timex just wanted to, you know, status quo with the Spectrum and just, Americanize it right, like they did with the 1000. Uh, that you know, I'm sure that would have sold some. Uh, the software surely was there, right? And so they kind of shot, you know, I think Timex, uh, yeah, I don't want to say shot themselves in the foot, but you know, by developing this new system and making it software incompatible with the Spectrum, that really, uh, you know, as far as marketability, put it down, you know, pretty low, I think. But you know, you're mentioning the ROM, they were trying to get ROMs made. Right for for the spectrum, no, or for the, the twenty sixty eight. Okay, no, and they couldn't get the ROMs made, and uh, uh, you know, so you're basically talking mask ROMs, right? Where they just mm -hmm. they actually program them at the when they um, when they uh, make the chips, right? There, there's a mask ROM. Um, so I didn't know about that. That's kind of an interesting story. To, to that that was a delay, I guess. You know, break, I mean, it was a significant delay. We had. Not anticipated that we didn't know. Yeah. They, now we had a whole new class of people in there. Now they were they were not software; they were hardware writers or mm -hmm. ROM, and uh, they knew what they wanted to do. But they they said three weeks <laughs> to, take, to take the spectrum and make it into the twenty sixty eight with joysticks and uh, cartridge reader. <laughs> yeah, That's right. All I hated. <laughs> And then it was three months, and then it was six months. In all this time, we had no cash flow. Right. So we chewed up the money, and as Dan said, the money was gone. Yeah, yeah. That's and we would have been we would have been defeated anyways. I'm not saying that sour grapes, but we were not going to. We Commodore died, Atari died, TI died, GRS died, and they because the IBM PC, even though it was expensive, came out. The junior and then the big guy and just changed the way things were done. Um, yeah. You could just I bought an IBM PC and never looked back. <laughs> yeah, I kind of moved on. You know, once Timex pulled out, I kinda like, okay, what am I, you know, what's out there now? Right. And uh, you know, I didn't do I didn't do a Commodore. I think that, you know, I started building IBM PC compatibles is really where I kind of went next from the Timex. But um 
Uh, it's just interesting that you mentioned, you know, so, I mean, don't cut, sell yourself short on some hardware knowledge there. Cause that's definitely, you know, I've never heard of that as being part of a delay for why the 2068 couldn't, you know, it kind of strikes me. It's funny because like, they weren't using like uh, EPROMs basically before in the development. <laughs> so, cause they were changing the code probably every day. So they probably had to burn new, uh, you know, new versions of the ROM pr pretty often as opposed to commit it to a, you know, to a permanent chip. Right. That's when it got trouble. Yeah. Because I think like, like in anything else, you look, when you know it's only in an EEPROM, you may not look as hard, but when it gets made, then they really send the QC guys in. And <laughs> <work>. <laughs> Yeah, and so that kind of also brings up the point where why the 2068 came out when it did is because, like you said, the money was running out. Uh, this thing was really getting pushed and delayed and delayed because I know they kind of wanted to come out with it probably in earlier 93, right? Like you said, yeah. And so it was, uh, you know, and so like, I, like I've mentioned in you know, other times in this these meetings is that the, you know, the ROM that we got wasn't fully baked, right? I mean, the hardware actually in the machine wasn't fully baked either. We just kind of, we got what we got because I think they wanted to get something out before Christmas of, 90, of 83. And uh, they just put together as much of the machines that they could and that worked, uh, you know, well. And I mean, considering the timeline and everything, they got most of it. You know, the, the joysticks worked, the sound worked. Uh, you know, all that stuff worked. It's just the bank switching, right? And and some of these other, I won't, I'll just say pie in the sky for lack of a better word that they were planning for the future, you know, was still, uh, you know, not baked in the machine. It was some of it was in there. Some of the code was in there. It really didn't do much, but, you know, it's kind of an interesting machine when you look at it from that perspective, because I don't think any of the other machines that ever came out for, you know, consumer use was half baked like that other than the 2068, you know, the VIC 20 wasn't the Commodore 64 wasn't, you know, all those are pretty much done deals by the time they came to fruition. Well, I, I can't remember exactly, but I, don't believe Timex Computer Corp put the 2060 out. It might have been Portugal. No, no, uh, you guys did from from November to basically February of '84. So it was on the market for what uh, five months? Really? I don't yep. remember. Yeah. Don't, 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 um, don't having a demo it or anything. Never went anywhere with it. Never put a cartridge in it in front of an audience. What? But, but, and, that, and so to me, that's kind of curious, George, because you're the person listed in the third party software guide, you know, that, that if, if you were somebody in that cottage industry, right, right, and you were writing software for the 2068, you got a copy of this guy, uh, Jeff Mazur, who wrote one of the books um, about the 2068, he got a copy of the guide. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so the last page of the guide says, you know, Here's the rules for submitting your software, and you know. By the way, you know, um, we're gonna we're gonna do various things to it, and send it to George. <laughs> it's got your name <laughs> there. <laughs> I just don't recall the 2068 making it making a dent in anything, really. I mean, they could have they could have got some out, but it wasn't like it was not not 1,000 numbers, definitely not. And it was, but it, you know, like, it, it did. And, and actually, George, I don't think anybody in the field had one. I don't think we had any. Really? Oh, you they wrote their code on tape and we put it on a cartridge. Because I'd, I'd have oh. to say they probably made, I don't know, David, maybe you know an exact number, but I, I'm going to have to say they probably made 100,000 plus out into the market. I think you're probably right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so after uh, that day when they closed up, there was nobody left but me, and I was doing another thing. So there could have been a continuous. That momentum. is that is crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so after you know after you guys closed up, uh, people came out with disk drive systems with RAM disks. Uh, you know, they they wrote somebody wrote a desktop publishing program that ran on the twenty sixty eight, which you know. To me is is pretty insane but <laughs> there you go <laughs> um <clears throat> did you have anything to do george with the uh conversion from like sinclair zx spectrum games to run on the 2068 because there obviously was some changes that had to be made and because of like you said you, the rom was different so there had to be somebody on the timex team that 
new. I, I, I can only tell you this. We, we evaluated every piece of software that, that I know of. Yeah. That we store. And I do not recall. Oh boy. I hope I'm not that senile. I uh -oh. do not recall ever, <laughs> ever in my lab, a 2068 with joysticks on it and the, and the cartridge from somebody playing a game. Really? Oh, That's great. PC, hmm. you know, I do not recall that. That machine did not make it that far in our world. Now that it yeah. lived on, but I, I think I would have remembered it. Now I had one. I had one and I wrote on it, but I didn't have any joysticks and I didn't have right. any, I wrote on the spectrum in a, in a different box. Because if I had joysticks, oh, wait, you know, this is what happens when you, uh, if I had joysticks. And, so I, and, I, under, and I understand that, gonna, George, because. I'm, bring a bell here. I'm coming back to a little bit. I think I didn't have a joystick. Yeah, I'm thinking because, you know, there wasn't really any first party Timex 2068 programs. You know, most of what I recall was ported over from the Spectrum. Spectrum, yeah. you, you mentioned ant attack right ant attack came out for the 2068 but it was a, a machine code program so they had to do some rom call changes right because the, the the routines they were calling in the rom were in different places on the 2068 and the spectrum i mean the game's identical but there had to be somebody that made those changes in the software that was the rom guys they must have been doing that making the car okay the Maybe. The yeah. okay interesting and interesting. i'm gonna i'm gonna Temper what I thought because I, my son is probably going to see this. You had a 2068 and you worked on it. Now, did I have joysticks on there? Because I could almost remember having to re read the port to see what was happening with the joystick and I was writing code. On it. So, you know, there was it was just a blur. Maybe I, <laughs> it was an exciting I blur. Wire, I, had the wire, I don't remember, but you know, it wasn't like the, the momentum wasn't there. We were like struggling, yeah. yeah. And we may actually have then produced some. And we, I know we had the cartridges working because we would put the cartridge in. Yeah, right. And and George actually, uh, Lon told us a funny story about the states and capitals, the twenty sixty eight version. You know that they they had it on cassette, right? And they ported it over to the cartridge, and uh, you know they plug it in. And they discovered that it always asked, you know, the, the same questions in the same order uh, because it was starting at exactly, it was starting exactly the same time. So they had to put in a little, uh, you know, a little question for the, for the person playing states and, you know, for the person using the states and capitals cartridge in order to let the uh you know let the frames counter advance enough so that the random number would be random <laughs> yeah, well, any, anytime you hard started somebody it always came up with the same number yeah exactly yeah so, uh do you remember um for the 1000 there was a, a kiosk that um retailers could get they could buy it was 300 bucks and you know you'd stuck it in your in your store and it had like a little 1000 and a little fake uh, 16k ram and a space for a tv and there was a uh, a little rom uh board that plugged into the back of the 1000 that ran this demo and the demo had a, a recipe on it for um i don't remember what the recipe was for maybe a chicken recipe or something um mm -hmm. And I, remember, then, I, remember, I remember the chaos, but I didn't. My my group didn't write that. Okay, you think somebody else wrote that that little piece of code? No, that must have been done by uh, the guy who designed the case for the twenty sixty eight. I never met him. Okay, David, were you, were you going to ask who wrote that recipe? It was your favorite. What, what was exactly, on? and I make it. I make it at least <laughs> once a month. <laughs> I, I know it so well. I can't even remember what it is. <laughs> once a month, I wouldn't call it a favorite. <laughs> well. Um, so, you know, this thing, um, when Timex went out of business, got out of the computer business, a whole raft of them ended up at a, um, you know, at a guy who sold stuff surplus like this. And uh, a couple years back, um, some folks in, 
in uh, Europe managed to get a hold of one and sort of deconstruct it and uh, figure out, you know, figure out what the program was on the ROM and, and how it worked. And then maybe two, three years ago, someone here found the same thing. And I ended up, turns out I ended up posting it to the same community that had already figured it out. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the upshot of all this is you, they have, they have reverse engineered it to the point that they are now building it again. <laughs> <laughs> you can if you hook up with the right guys you can get a circuit board and you can program the rom yourself and plug it into your 1000 and have the in-store demo <laughs> you know kind of along those lines that david's mentioning did you have anything george to do with the uh you know the cartridge player for the for the 1500 and the 1000 because they they made a couple of cartridges right that uh mm -hmm. in states and capitals was one of them <laughs> uh, that made well, a cartridge for the 1000 and that i would rather have ant attack on my cartridge sorry no i they made cartridges and i you could you could slide them in and they would work yeah yeah but you they you didn't have anything to do with that I, I, why would i be asking one of my guys how do i read that port that's a stick what's what's the sequence yeah you know, oh well, well i was i was I was mentioning on the 1000 because there's a, the 1510, the cartridge player for the 1000. And the, and the 1500. Well, the... yeah, I mean, you can play it on the 1000 or the 1500. It was kind of designed along the 1500 lines. But uh, so basically it's for the, you know, the, the 1000 or the ZX81, the 1500. Did you have anything to do with those cartridge uh, software conversions to, to ROM? No. Okay. So that was some, uh, some of the... One of these ROM guys again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we were just getting software and looking at it and getting the masters made. And right. So working with Chuck on the verb, and I had two young ladies working for me who would work with him and describe everything about that piece of software. So he would write it down and then he wrote it in really good English. We tried writing our own documentation, you know, and it was just like, yeah, it wasn't going. It wasn't going. <laughs> you so, know, some of the some of the I just remember some of the funnier things that, that did happen. And is Timex made a lot of uh, washers with the Muppets on it. We had a Muppet wash line. And one day Billy said, "You got to go down the down the road and uh, go to this barn of studios in there. You're gonna make a commercial." And when I got there, Jim Henson was there. All the Muppets were there. <laughs> we got to wash. They, they put the ZX up, on the, the Sinclair up on the table, and the Muppets were tossing it around, playing with it. <laughs> Ooh, uh, I had a script. Somebody wrote a script. And, you know, the girls were behind with the sticks. And I said, look at that. That's, that's that guy from the Muppet Show. You know? <laughs> and so we did a lot of that kind of stuff that um, marketing, it was all marketing. We making sales pitch and demos. I think one of my people was out almost, well, somebody was out at least one day a week, two days a week, some store somewhere, with me, meaning the regional sales manager in the store, set up a table and right there where people walk by, they were showing it to them. Interesting. So, And, and I'm sure that if, even though the people that were doing this were also in California. They just hired some kids and the marketing people there had demos going. The demos going quite a bit. Yeah. It was that Timex just inherited the design. We didn't, you know, that ramp pack was it was, was made that might've been acceptable in I always say it's acceptable in Britain because they, <laughs> but it was not acceptable here. And I could, I could show them. I said, look at Mr. Olson, this will fall off if I don't put these erasers. It will fall off. And does did he convey that message back to the, the uh, people in Dundee? I don't know. You... Remember the company was on. We went from thirty-three. William watches the 16. We lost half our watch business in like two years because oh of my rent. gosh. So it was on a ropes at that time. And then we came out, you know, later on we came out with the Iron Man 
we finally got into the in the in the goal. Yes. And, and that's what burned my lab down. I my lab was right next to the guy who was doing the indigo wafers and baking them in an oven. And he went home one night and left the oven up. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my gosh. And, and the metal wall, the metal wall melted like and it came right over to my desk, and you could see that melted and left my desk and went down the alleyways to the where the, the other people sat and just melted everything. Oh my God. That's craziness. Yeah. And I, I you know, what are you gonna do? You know, Timex made made stuff. They made bombs, yeah, they made guidance systems, so they could make things, but they were mostly mostly mechanical things. Mm -hmm. Gyros made great gyros. Hmm. Sold that business to Bendix. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah you know, the, the talk, speaking about the gyros, uh, Danny Ross did bring up in his uh, talk that he was uh, talking to someone. Was it in China or China. Korea? China. China. He was in China. Uh, he said, "I didn't know he went there, but I." I once again, that was leveled above me too. So yes, if he thought we had gy gyros, then we still had them. Right. But I know we did have to sell the gyro business, which was very lucrative. Nine nine thousand people, and Bendix took all of our gyro technology. Oh wow! Okay. You mentioned a team of folks that you hired to review the tapes. Where did you get those folks? I mean, because you know you're in the middle of Connecticut. Yeah, that's the, the and and that that would be the answer. If I see how you answered the question. I got people. I didn't know what I was looking for. Yeah, you know, it, it, it wasn't like you could look ahead and see what you. I wanted people who could write software. I wanted people who would write software because that's what I did. I want them. I want them pumping out software. But I didn't get that. Right. <laughs> when I, when they got the job, I said, "Do you write software?" No. I said, oh, "I know I interviewed you," and I think I'm pretty sure I asked that question. Well, I have written some software, you know. So it, but that young lady was very good at interpreting things. So she became like. And I and I hired another kid who had Zilog experience, and he sat with that Zilog right beside him. And not once did he let me ever try to make a program on it. He didn't know how to do that. Huh. <laughs> it wasn't like a yeah. I was in the middle of nowhere with no. I mean, if I was in Maui and where, where where's the California place where everybody was Silicon Valley, it would have been a different story. Right, right. But here I was in, in Naugatuck. Middlebury, Oxford, Con rural Connecticut. Yeah. And, uh, the only one I got, and Sue Courier stole him from me, and he became her assistant, <laughs> vice president or whatever, in many of her other ventures afterwards. And he couldn't write a line of code, but he was organized. When a tape came in, George had to do nothing. Rod took care of everything. Cataloged it, set it up for testing, took it to the labs, had Cook make the tapes, make, worked with Chuck. He did everything. And he was really good. It was a big load off my shoulder because I was my back to them writing software until I finally gave up. I wrote Dragmaster. Anybody ever see that one? Right, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I woke up one night. I got to write a program with the speedometer over here and the tachometer over here. I was watching some TV show or something. And you got you, you got to beat the time. You got to go as fast as you can, but not blow the engine, and then see what your time is. Oh, you're stupid! Yeah, but yeah. you know, now, George, George, just to kind of just to kind of uh, inspire you a little bit. There's there recently there was a guy he posted on YouTube. He made a nuclear. Uh, power plant simulator all on the ZX81. So it shows it, you know, the rods going in and out, and you want so much power. But he wrote that all for the, you know, for the 1000. It's it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, program. And, and what what would be the motive there? From? It, where, where does the motive come? What is the drive that would drive oh, somebody to do that? Well, so the the English um, uh, ZX81 adds suggested that that was a possibility that you could run a nuclear power plant from your you know there was there was some piece of copy that said you know you can do anything from 
you know, X to running a nuclear power plant. And he's, he said, oh, okay, I'll write that and we'll do that. <laughs> it's a very funny video because he's British too. So, you know, very dry yeah. sense of humor. <laughs> I, that's the part, you know, I'm saying I got to go back in time and I really enjoyed this. That went, but what keeps, what keeps you having a monthly call? There has to be some, did you get one and it changed your life? Well, you, yeah. you got a job. Uh, yeah. Things yeah. like this would be, I, it saved me from becoming a, a rock star or vice versa. You know, so, I just can't, I can't well, imagine how this could go on. All right. So I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I, I actually lived um, <clears throat> 90, 100 miles north of you guys when wow. you were doing this up in Western Massachusetts. And uh, I was, I don't know, 13 or 14. And I had access, we had computers in the school. Like we had some trash 80s in one of the school schools. We had some apples in another school. This is in, in junior high school. And I also had access to a mainframe, a control data cyber, which was this, you know, giant 60 bit machine um, back in the, in the, um, in the early 80s but my mom was a student and so we had no budget whatsoever uh but when the timex came out for 99 bucks i got that my mom got it for me for christmas i think and i spent just hours upon hours upon hours sitting in front of it you know typing in programs programming to do stuff uh one of the things that I learned to do rather quickly was put a larger heat sink on it <clears throat> so it wouldn't, you know, crap out on me from being overheated. Um, and, you know, I remember sitting in front of my computer, you know, playing with it, typing in programs, whatever, uh, late one night. And, you know, I was just so engrossed in what I was doing that when I looked up and paid attention, it was the next morning. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, that having that computer at home was really the catalyst for me being able to, you know, learn to program, you know, re relatively well and how to operate computers. And it led to being, you know, I, was, I worked at a computer store the next summer, like when I was 15, I think, selling Commodore 64s. Um, and then, you know, over the course of my the next couple of years, I went to college after after high school, and I thought, you know, I'll go on computer science. And uh, they said you're going to have to learn COBOL, and I said, no, I'm not. I'm changing my my major. <laughs> um, but I knew that because of all of the stuff that I had learned, you know, I was really really good at computers. Like I bet a lot of the folks, everybody here you know, this has the sort of same really good at computers by the time they're 18 or 19. And, you know, this is the late eighties of, yeah, very, the very late eighties. And I knew that I could get a job just based on that skill set alone. It didn't matter what I did in terms of, of a degree. And as it turns out, that was the case. Uh, you know, I got this, I got this bachelor's in liberal studies, which I call majoring in undeclared. Um, <clears throat> and then I got a job at a state university here in New York, uh, way, up, way up in upstate New York, uh, as, as their webmaster back in the late 90s. And that's been my career path ever since. Uh, programming PHP, a little bit of Perl, um, <clears throat> and you know other web programming languages. And, and now I'm at a, uh, a firm that does major web design and migrations that's you know we, we we did the national air and space museums website that was uh one of our recent projects all well, because I can, only, I can only hope that there was 10 000 other people like you there were that that's the thing the is that there were there were you know ten thousand. there were more yeah. than ten thousand. well i want to come at it from a different angle if that's okay um because i don't have that story that david has with the time whatsoever um in fact, I didn't grow up with the Timex. I mean, I had also an 8-bit computer. Um, I'm 50 years old, and uh, I grew up with the Commodore 64, and later I got into some of the other computers. 
Um, but the Timex to me is, especially the 1000, now that I, I finally have one in my office, which I got yesterday. Thank you, Carl and Ryan. Um, it's, it's got 2K of RAM, you know, so I have twice the amount of RAM as the 81, who those guys. And um, I, I find it's, it's black and white, it's limited. Uh, it comes with a pretty interesting basic, which is a little unusual because it's not Microsoft based, which is what I'm used to um, for the most part. And you can do quite a bit with it. And um, I did try your program, George, a few weeks ago, maybe in January, Grimm's Fairy Trails. Um, and it wasn't a great program, but it was able to do quite a bit with the little 1000. Um, and like you said, it was able to run the code fast enough. And I thought it was written mostly in totally in basic, but apparently no, it wasn't totally in basic, um, which explains how it was able to keep up with some of the things I was doing, which was moving around the screen quickly. Um, but I find playing around with these computers, um, it's almost, it's almost like going back a bit and, uh, figuring out how we got to where we are now. And I find that just interesting. So that's my bit. Yeah. And I know for me, George, I'm more of a hardware guy, right? So, I mean, I, you don't know it at the time, but you know, I was what, 13, 14 years old as well when I got it with 1000 again for the price, right? Because, uh, you know, the Commodores and the other tar, you know, they were, you know, hundreds of dollars more, right? So, and parent, my parents at least, and I'm sure a lot of other kids' parents at that time were looking at these things as toys, right? These are toys, like a like a like a Atari, you know, the VCS, the, the the game console, right? But you're learning to program on these things, so now now you're turning, you're you're making it a, you know, you're turning a whole nother leaf with this thing. You're actually making basic programs. You're learning programming you know basic and then for me i went on to learn how to program uh the you know the z80 in assembly right and then i went on like i said i mentioned i kind of got an ibm later and i learned to do assembly on the uh, ibm pc right which is similar right it has the uh, intel chip in it so the zilog but um uh, you know so i kind of look at it from the standpoint of my parents getting me this thing and i kind of remember their reactions and, and maybe they had more grandiose visions but, uh, you know, I think a lot of the parents looked at these things as toys, right? Oh, they're going to entertain you and, and they kind of get you out of their hair for a little bit, right? But, you know, little, little did they know that, you know, these would go on to be career defining, you know, products for, for us kids, right? And so, and I don't think you guys, you know, Timex were really necessarily looking at it that way. Um, but that, that's certainly one of the big, I think, influencers that a lot of us, you know, kids, you know, that are 50 ish now, uh, you know, that's, that was our first experience to computers and to programming and to, you know, I got us hooked, you know, especially for me, the hardware, I mean, the 1000 is pretty simple, but I mean, it can do a lot of things. Once you get into IOs and the things you can attach to it and read sensors and make it do things physically, you know, all those kind of, you know, <laughs> it just, uh, uh, you know, it opens up a whole new world for you when you're a kid, you know, I mean, the world's your oyster, so to speak, you know, I mean, there's so many things that you dream that it can do, and then you go out and do it. And it's like, wow. So. Uh, do, do you have a yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah, got to say something. I'm not a programmer, but during the 1984, 85, I had a friend who was doing his PhD at University of Southern California in economics. So he needed to have a iterative formula to be run. And he was running on a TI-58 calculator. So he came to me and he said, hey, what can we do? I wrote the software and I am not a programmer. At that time, I wrote the software, pure basic, and we ran his model on the Timex Sinclair and it converged. He was so happy. That's my story. In addition to that, I spent about my three years of my spare time to program on 2068, a kind of calculus program that would take a four by four matrix, inverse it. I finished that and I closed all the books, put the computers into the boxes, and one of these days, somebody's gonna inherit it. My story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I will follow on to that story and say that that was one of the things not a lot of people realize that I encountered in doing my science fair project on it, which was doing matrix 
calculations because the five byte floating point of precision was greater than the single precision on all the other basics. And that allowed better scientific calculations, even on the 81. Uh, and I, and think I never, that, I never and looked I, at it in, in that mode because we were just trying to market software. And I'm glad I, I hear it now that it was being put to use by younger younger people, maybe made their careers happen. Well, because it was 9995. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's. We didn't get any feedback because we were going in 1984. <laughs> but, but, you know. Well, I think the now, price point was the important thing. Ten years for a ago, lot of people. I, got, I would get calls up to 10 years ago, it stopped. I was getting calls. Hey, why did you go out of business? <laughs> but it stopped until David came came around a couple of years back. <laughs> you, I, yeah. I, you were I, a little a little curmudgeonly. It was like I didn't I didn't build a machine. I have no concept of uh how a computer works enough to build something on the end of it. So I saw somebody on one of your videos, uh he went to the, we had a soldering, he was making something, and I said, Oh, they're taking that thing apart, they're reverse engineering this thing. Uh, I tried to fix a circuit board in one of my scopes over here, and I didn't realize that DC had polarity, and I fried that baby. <laughs> <laughs> so don't put me in here any hardware. You know? <laughs> Well, dude, the other thing, George, is even though, you know, a lot of us are hardware guys, you know, obviously we, we have to, you have to learn some software because the software has to interact with the hardware. But I think that makes you a little bit of a better programmer because now you understand kind of both sides of the coin, right? I mean, you can be a great programmer and not really understand the hardware. There's, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. I'm not, you know, there certainly are great people that do that because like C, right? You don't really deal with the hardware as much. Right, object oriented programming, you're kind of trying to cover your bases where running that software on as many different platforms as you can, and you're kind of making it hardware agnostic. Right. But when you do get hardware, you know, focused on the hardware, then you can start making machine language things that really take advantage of the hardware that's built into the machine. Right. And that's kind of way the way cars are these days, right? All the all the computers and cars are, I'm sure a lot of them are written in assembly language because uh, you know they need to they need to be for the for the speed and to take advantage of whatever hardware capabilities that they they're building into those computers. So I, when when we finally cut the IBM port, we went to HP UX machines. Mm. And this is where I got into some exotics with the fourth generation languages, mm. Nomad, and then we got into firewalls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got in i got responsibility for netware novel network oh my god i, I had a and maybe maybe we're starting to catch up with what you guys might have started on there uh, oh, yeah thing crashed memory leaks all over the place then i got windows nt servers and exchange came out and it was always me who was chosen and that was my actually my title new projects so from the day that I started with the Sinclair to the day I retired, I was the manager of new projects. <laughs> oh. Bleeding edge, cutting edge. I always, it, will this work for us? And it was very challenging, but you know, you had to build an exchange server and uh, boy, boy, they were, they, they didn't, they didn't, oh, not, my, Microsoft didn't mince words. They had like a, oh my God. You know, so we had to maybe got a little help with it. Consulting. Did, did you we interact? Had build, we had plants all over the world, so I had to build eleven exchange servers and ship them all over the country, in the world. Cebu, everywhere had to have exchange all at once. And uh, did you interact with Sir Clive Sinclair? Pardon? Did you interact with Sir Clive Sinclair? No. I I, I think I met him once. Nigel, yes, he was his, who was his right hand man, yes, but not Clive himself. Yeah, yeah. From he what wasn't I... interested in what we were doing. We were marketing, and I think he knew it. He, I think he knew where the direction Timex was going to do it, and I don't think he was that happy with it. But we manufactured his product, and he went along with it. 
I mean, it was not something you could dump, just dump out there. But I would say I got like nine or 10, 20 of you out here who actually <laughs> didn't need your handheld. You did it. You did it yourself. And that was, that's always been one of my things with my, my kid. My, my son, you know, he was a, he went to a, a local college. And what's he do now? He runs a bunch of administrative PCs and programs and software for the University of Connecticut. So I don't know if that's generic. Is it is it inherited? <laughs> is it inherited? You know, and like I say, your your parents bought you, you taught it, taught it, taught it to school. They bought you a computer. They had computers. It doesn't happen that way for everybody, but if you get in on the ground floor, well. I'll tell you one, and you might, get, might have heard of this technology. I was in charge of meeting the new people who showed up in the lobby after, after we were gone out of the computer business. A gentleman came in and he, he came in and he said that, he gave me his name, and he sat down and he said he worked for the Rand Corporation. Wow, he was young. And I said, really? He said, yeah. Younger than me again, of course. It wasn't easy. It was easy to be that way. I worked for the Rand Corporation. I recently went out on my own. And I've got something I'd like to show Timex. So he, I took him upstairs and he had a breadboard. I guess you call him a breadboard, right? He had all mm -hmm. these chips on it. And he had a little glass window. And he asked if he could put this disc into my PC. And the my PC started making lines on the screen and he held the disc up to it and he transferred all that data right into his little computer. I said, what the hell? He said, yeah, I can, you can, I can load your watch with your calendar by you just holding it in front of the screen with my software and the, and the hardware. And it was, it was called, Timex, of course, took him up on his offer. He built the breadboard. He had it in production. like He had it ready to go. Oh, the guy was there 24 hours a day. Data link. You ever come Data link, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. I actually still own one that's functional, believe it or not. Yep. <laughs> that was, was, that yeah, was our first, CR2 first return to another world. And like Data link, we, nobody had Data link. This kid was phenomenal. I, you know, he ended up killing himself in a gas station. Mm -hmm. Shot himself in there or something. Oof. If you keep batteries in your data link, it stays ticking. <laughs> we kept the data link going, and that's when I was now in charge of interviewing people who could write whatever Microsoft needed, because Microsoft wanted in on data link also. Oh, that's crazy. So I had three or four guys, and one who ended up being my boss. He became the head of IT. <laughs> Well, Phil there, he was, I, mean, yeah, I interviewed all these guys and of course they were more dying, you know, young energy and go anywhere in the world, do anything. And they, they, they got the, the left, all of them left and went to work for Microsoft in the end. They didn't hang around trying to clear. Oh, so that, yeah, that actually them. reminds me. Um, there was a guy, Victor, uh, Victor Ship. Yeah. He went off to work for Microsoft, I think. He could have. Victor was my first technician. I forgot about Victor. Yes. Victor took the ZX81 apart. Did he? Yeah, okay. he, he looked all over. I didn't understand a word he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Victor and I later on went to NASCAR and we wrote software to keep track of the 42 cars on the track through some kind of handheld device that Timex got their hands on. Huh. And NASCAR did not believe in putting any gadgets on the cars. It all had to be done by cousin Billy Bob up on the tower up there. And it all had to be manual. So they would, as the car crossed the finish line, they would hit it. And it would, they had a pro, and it would then, I would sort all the fastest times and who was, I was keeping track of the race on there. Yeah, kind of cool. Victor took that around all through the NASCAR circuit, but it, they didn't it didn't go for it. That was too sophisticated. Now, of course, they got sensors in the cars. <clears throat> At that time, it was a real family thing, and would have been a good application for the 
I think we were running it on an IBM because I had dual monitors, one keeping the track of the race and one for the pit crew. So uh -huh. I know it was a, definitely an IBM machine. So, but, so uh, hello, fun? George. Yes. Sorry, I, I have a question. Thank you for participating tonight. Uh, I live in South America, in Argentina, and I like to, to ask you if uh, you remember any software was created in Timex for for the computer in, in, in assembly language or a, a mixed language. Uh, because in, in Argentina, many titles arrive in by the, the third party companies. For example, uh, I don't remember uh, at this time, but here is not the original titles created by Timex. Maybe we see a, a, a copies or, or, or programs made or by a distributors, okay? Uh, I don't know if I can answer that one. Hmm. I don't, I, a multi-language versions? Yes, for example, if you have a, a program that they have a part writing in basic and the part writing in assembler, for example, no. not, not for a screen, no. Well, no, okay. I don't think like that. Okay, thank you. But here we not have sometimes the, the manual, the original manual, because I don't know if a multiple copy for travelers that get the one cassette and then reply in multiple copies in, in locally. At this time, we not received the original titles. I don't know if uh, because the, the machine was not uh, in produce. Uh, I don't know the reason, but we not received the many, many titles in original. I have the, the original titles in in the box for Timex, but that is not the real. How far we got with any kind of worldwide distribution? I really don't know. I'm sure we tried. I think we those that came back, I think Danny alluded to it. They tried to reprocess them and send them back out to another. Is that me or? No, that's Gustavo's connection is a little flaky, but okay, yeah. sometimes the video portion, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they probably put them out, send, send them around, but uh, there, was no, there was no, at that time, it was English only. Yeah, thank you, George. You're probably getting stuff from mainly from the U.S. people and maybe maybe some British people. You know, maybe some British folks are sending you some software to consider. Oh, British, yeah. Yeah. Because I think I think at that time, Portugal wasn't really, I mean, you kind of, you guys kind of were your they own came, thing. They came after us. There right. Was a, there was a, I don't remember their names, but they kept that thing going. Yeah. So it was the Sinclair, Timex Sinclair 1000, or was it the ZX? But Portugal kept that thing alive for the longest time. I would say years. Yeah, I think they, they went to 80, 80, over there, and they were, and that's where I saw a lot of stuff. And I said, "Well, somebody can work it. Somebody knows how to do it." And anyway, you know. Anyways, I did lose interest in it. In it, uh, technology was going, sending me in a different direction. And I, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, Portugal. Uh, I don't know where else. I don't. I don't recall ever getting anything from South Korea. I guess Dan would know. Maybe stuff was made there, or I don't. know. The Timex had a unique way of manufacturing goods. So they, if it was going to be manufactured or multi-country, they knew how to do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask a question for Tim Swenson, who actually just walked away. But um, I'm surprised he hasn't actually asked this question already. Tim, are you there? Um, my question is, I see you have your telescopes in the background. And Tim has brought up several times that he's interested in astronomy. And I think he used, was it your 2068? Uh, to have some astronomy programs running on it? It's, Tim, it's, you know what I'm talking about? My I think Tim, had the, here? Tim probably used the 1000. The 1000? Yeah. No, it was, yeah. Uh, you cut no, out, Tim. I, was not. I, don't, I don't have anything like that. I have this little box from ZWO China called ASI Air. It replaces laptops in the field for astronomy. <laughs> it takes the image, controls the camera, moves the scope, displays it on your tablet, and I and I can do it out over the Wi-Fi, so I no longer have to really go out and sit among the critters. 
George, that sounds so <laughs> civilized. You don't you don't want to use a, a one thousand to actually drive the. Uh, I don't have a one thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so, George, you, your mention about the the uh, NASCAR thing reminded me that um, there's a story out there. Actually, I'll put it. Let me make sure I have it in my my buffer here. But um, there's a story about the NR. NHRA, the drag racing folks, and uh, how they came up with a data recorder and the very, you know, primordial design that they did, the, you know, the, the, the working out the idea was with a 1000. And, you know, you can tell it, they, they don't get the details quite right in the story, but they talk about, you know, this, this little tiny Timex, then they kind of mentioned that they thought it was DOS based. But they also mentioned the thermal printer, and you know, between if you read between the lines, you can you can see that they use this thing to record data, you know, live as the machine, you know, as the drag uh, drag race car is running to uh, measure, you know, axle speed. And what they were, according to the article, what they were really interested in was, uh, you know, when you spin those tires, those big back tires, really fast, they they deform and and become you know more round um and i guess that solving that problem helps solve speed and and whatever but i just thought it was hilarious that the first data made, recorder was a one made a computer because we didn't know what they were going to use them for yeah you know, we, exactly you know so when you make something that has a cpu in it now the other segment of society emerges and yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fine. You got basic programs, and somebody's going to write a game, and it's going to be in it. But I'm going to tell you what: I'm going to hook it up and run all my appliances in my house. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, because you because okay. you know George, yeah, yeah, yeah. we would have had a hardware that had hardware okay. <laughs> that would have been a better use for that baby. <laughs> yeah, because you you mentioned you know getting in on the ground floor, George, and I mean the it, it's hard to do that these days, right? Because the 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 floor has shifted. Right there, well, there will never be the the getting in on the ground floor like it was in the early '80s. It just it, that'll that'll never happen again. And you know the the 1000 kind of equates to, you know, I don't know if you know what a Raspberry Pi is or one of these ESP32. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's kind of similar to what those things are now, right? So it's that, that's kind of the ground floor we're talking about in in in, in 2020s, right? Is a, a Raspberry Pi or something like that. Uh, that's what the you know the 1000 kind of was back in, you know back in the 80s right so I mean we we didn't really like you said we didn't really realize that but it was a new technology for all of us and once we figured out what was possible to to do with it is it like it opened up so many doors right yeah I think I know Clive, Clive and his people they 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 had that vision I really think they did I think Clive yeah. knew what he built yeah. he built a machine and you know, and I'm sure that his his goal wasn't to market all kinds of software. He built a computer. He built what did he, he built a bunch of things, cars. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. He built this computer as a computer, and you didn't have to. Oh, I'm going to write a game, states and capitals, and I got to make that. Done. <laughs> well, you know, I know we've shown it on this. They're, gonna, they're doing a nuclear power plant. Thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've shown it on this uh, meeting before, but I think Carrier, you know, the HVAC people, Carrier, yeah, yeah. Uh, they they must they must have used. I think it was a 1500, 1500. right? Yep. Yeah, they they customized a 1500 and put their own ROM in it, and they used it to control, uh, you know, an HVAC system. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know, I know for me personally, the guy I used to work with back in the 80s, Art Colgate, he uh. The 2068 was the foundation of the of his three-axis milling machine. It controlled his three-axis milling machine, so he could program in there to, you know, to make all kinds of different things with the with the milling machine. So, I mean, there's some definitely some industrial applications that these computers ended up in. Yeah, George, I want to ask you about Billy uh, Skirm a little bit. Uh, it sounds like he was a a big ideas kind of guy um uh, he was he was more like a lion tamer he he could take that thing that you that he that i was just given yeah and make a jump you know what i mean he it, you well you need this for that we can get that i'll get that you know okay. he was never he never ever poo-pooed this this machine yeah 
always had it. You know, his salesmen loved him. They loved him. <laughs> he put energy. He put energy in it. I mean, uh, he wasn't interested. I'm sure he was interested in finance, but Billy was a self-educated man. Okay. He said he went to college, but we always suspected that he was a self-educated man. And it okay. was a little... It was he came out of Little Rock, Arkansas as a computer operator on an IBM 360 oh. and propelled himself to the director of IT in Timex. Yeah. Later on in the state of Connecticut, he was the lead webmaster for one of their divisions. So he had he had a charisma. I yeah. think <laughs> and he had an ability. He never he never he never let me get away with saying no. <laughs> well he said, no, so part he said, of I know you'll get it. Go home. Go home and take the machine with you and come back in the morning. I know you'll do it because that's what you're going to do with it. You're going to stay up all night. You're right, that you're going to write that thing, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, really. So, so he he went to um he went to a meeting of the Long Island uh uh Sinclair user group. And this was maybe a couple of years after when he was at Scion, he was a VP at Scion. Scion, that's where he went after that. That's right, Scion. And uh, you know, of course, he was there because Cyan had a new product and he wanted to, you know, talk about the Cyan product and the guys, you know, in the, the Sinclair group wanted to talk about the, you know, the Sinclair stuff. Um, so he told them this story about a machine that was going to come after the 2068 that was going to have, you know, even higher resolution, more colors, go faster you know, even had probably had people would probably have go faster stripe stripes on it, you know, like a race car. Um, and then this story has been, you know, perpetuated. Uh, it's it's on a bunch of different websites. And, you know, he, he gave it a number, a model number that I think he may have pulled out of his head. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Once again, he he, he left on Monday. And you're right. Nigel Searle grabbed his ass so fast from Scion. He wasn't unemployed less than an hour. <laughs> so he did a lot of stuff with Scion, and he was he was based in Connecticut. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. Be, and he had product. And I think I met up with him a few times. He came. He was showing his stuff. But no, no. I'm sure Billy had. He had an imagination. He wasn't. He wasn't going to be stopping. Oh, one K chip. 2K, got to be 2K. <laughs> I, I said, we haven't even turned it on yet. 2K. Nigel told me it should have been 2K. That's awesome. <laughs> every every step of the way, he was, uh, he was, you know, he'd come down and say, how's the software going? He'd look at it. He was very friendly to new people. So uh, he was a pretty good golfer, too, and I was the manager of the golf time which golf league for like four. <laughs> and then you know, so we had a we had a good rapport in that company with the uh, with the techies. All the techies got along. It was it was always uh, at war with budgets. With oh, can't have that, can't have that. But, uh, huh. it was it was a company that could have innovated, and they did make some. Indigo was a was a lifesaver. Yeah. Fred, Fred saw this in Europe on a billboard. Hmm. And he, he said, what's that? He said, that's the end of the, whatever they call it, incandescent. Uh, in Electroluminescent. Electroluminescent. Yep. He says, I'm going to come back. I come back and he says, I want this thing in a watch. Now, it wasn't so much that they couldn't make a small little thing, but they had to power it. Mm -hmm. And this took a long time to develop. It took a few, several years to get that. And of course, what did they do? They sold it, the rights to it too. They used it for a couple of years and then they sold in the globe so that anybody could use it. They oh, didn't. Wow. Otherwise, yeah, because... we, would, we would still, you know, I, I don't yep. have a, I, when I left Timex, I gave me a watch that wasn't, was my choice, but then I bought a Casio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. The tiny, All right. Little, tiny little light bulb. Seiko. Now I have a, Samsung. Yeah. yeah. And I, once in a while, I go back and look at the Timex watch site, and they're now just getting into those fitness watches. How many years have those been out? Uh -huh. uh -huh. you know, and the corporate headquarters that was a modern day architectural wonder 
was closed. And I can't find one article where they went. Hmm. All North American operations disappeared. Disappeared. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. So, so, question. Did you hire any engineers from General Nedecom? I don't know. They were neighbors. Of Timex? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, we, we had uh, we had uh, a, a data com. Yeah, was general it? data com. Data general data com. Okay, yeah, yep. yeah. They bought the Timex building. Yep. Uh, and turned it into. And they also bought the a building from an, the first company I started to work for, Unroyal. They bought a big gigantic building, but they they didn't last long. Maybe they did in in terms of being a modem, whatever they made modems. Now the buildings are a wreck. General data com, I think, is gone. Yeah, we don't use modems anymore. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I think Timex still owns the buildings. The Fred is still alive. I can't remember because he told me, "Don't ever sell property. Don't you buy a piece of property, never sell it. Keep it and rent it or rent it to somebody, but don't ever sell it." As I was selling my house, I was telling him the story because I was, I was his friend in a way. So far down the totem pole in employment status, but he wanted technology, and I gave him a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, buying water well, kids in there. Well, George, you've uh, said a couple times that you were so low down on that totem pole, but yet you seem to have had quite an influence on well, what was, was going on there. Totem pole was only three, three, three runs. Danny, Billy, me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was consumed by the by the software. Billy did the hardware, and Danny did the marketing. And now we each had a little staff. We grew, we grew horizontally. Danny got some more marketing people. We did commercials. The hardware we turned over a little bit to Carlos, who traveled the world looking for people to build things, I guess. And the software group. Well, we were 30, 40,000 people strong, I suppose, whatever. <laughs> the stuff just came, came in daily. Envelopes full of cassettes. <laughs> and uh, that was that was remarkable how many people could actually write for that. And I, I was stumbling writing a simple game. And Rich and wherever else Nigel had that thing or fly, New Zealand, Australia. They were way <laughs> they were way I, I did happen to have nine hundred thousand outlets or something like that so I could stick it in. I had a little clout. You you didn't make any of the engineers put a real keyboard on your computer for you? Hmm? You didn't make any of the engineers put a real keyboard on your computer for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, David, are you trying wrong. to sell him something? I didn't, I didn't like, you know, it was a, it, the the basic itself is basic, but the way it was implemented. You hit it one key, and the word "print" came up, right? mm -hmm. and you, it, it, and it was it was supposed to be easy to learn. And obviously, I'm glad to hear now that it, it in the right hands, in the right hands, it it did it did make an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I just love I I'm not crazy about the show, but little Sheldon walks into the Radio Shack store, and he asks for a job. Do you ever see that episode? Mm -mm. And, and the guy says well you're kind of young how old are you i'm nine and he says well you can't work in a radio shack store well a customer comes in and, and he wants to buy one of the trs computers and the manager knows nothing about it he says, well i don't know anything about it and sheldon proceeds to go through every spec that was ever on it <laughs> and, yeah and some of us were that kid. And the guy said, why don't you come back when you're a little older? I can't. You won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always kick my head. Well, you, you know, and uh, I got a lot of little Sheldons out here, you know, in the world. And that's nice. I I enjoyed building things. Uh, that's just a little Palm Pilot software. And uh, this is on my own. I, I still had a job, but at night I had to have something to do. The Sinclair was gone. I... Something to keep you occupied, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you I haven't seen that episode of Young Children, but it does bring to mind like if you had to like 
foresight and what you could have done specifically, like on your level, like at the lowest end of the totem pole, what do you think you might have been able to do to make a difference and maybe make Timex last throughout the 80s or something like that in America? I think we would have had to, at that time, you would have had to dumb that machine down. Mm. You would have had to make it all one piece, the RAM inside, easy to use, and no tape. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I, I did some thinking. I thought, well, this, this computers came out and, and, and now I watch TV and I say, uh, the little kids are saying, we're doing coding in school. now. We're doing coding. And I'm thinking, what are you coding? What are they teaching? In, are they te if I put my little red truck over here, the little blue truck goes over there. I said, that ain't coding. Not coding. Teach the kids coding. You know, but that's what the, actually, I, I got a little cynical. I think America just got dumbed down in the, in the 1980s. And they couldn't handle the technology. So, I mean, certainly the, the ones who made the money could. The average place, it, it was it, it got to be turnkey, instant. I'm not going to learn basic, but what I use it for. <laughs> but not, well, I can see now, I was wrong there. There is a, there, and, and to keep it going and to have it influence your career. It, it, it influenced mine because it took me out of my little shell that I lived in and exposed me to how the rest of the world and I you knew I met the people at Commodore we went traveling we met them you know I saw how the other people were doing it yeah but they were manufacturing their own goods I think yeah we not. I mean they were not they were designing them too Apple he didn't just go buy somebody else's computer and try to market it him and Wozniak built it Mm -hmm. And they built it the way they, and we inherited a already pre pre, pre design. And our company was a marketing company. Timex marketed washes until they went out of business. Well, as just a marketing company, I even though I, I mentioned earlier that I was a Commodore 64 user at the time the Timex came out or around that time, um, I did have people that I knew have the Timex computer. And they got it for the reasons other people mentioned here because it was inexpensive. And um, it, the, the, I think the Timex uh, made a dent and you know, if it didn't get these people to um, get started, uh, then it influenced them to get another computer and maybe they started with the Timex and moved on to other ones maybe quickly, but it, I think Timex did a good thing. Like I, I feel. I think with the better interfaces, it would have been a, a bigger hit. The yeah. interfaces were not well, yeah, but I don't know. That's what I'm, my biggest trouble was I get phone call. I, I ran the help desk too. I oh dear. Not only did the software, we <laughs> ran the help desk. And call after call, I can't get the tape to vote. Yeah. And that was, that was a, a block tape, stars and stripes or whatever was in the box. We gave him two free tapes. I can't load it. I said, the, and I could, I could, I could, I, I listened on the phone to that little screeching going on in there. Mm -hmm. And that's how I told a lot of people to go to Radio Shack and buy that other computer right now. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot we ran the help desk, lots of calls. And I, and I just don't know. I mean, maybe every kid in America ran to the store and begged their parents for it. I do not know this. I just know that we dug a, we dug a, the Mariana Trench in Torrington, Connecticut dumped hundreds of thousands of VX spectrums into it. Oh boy. Wow. It's another story that I heard and then buried them. <laughs> well, and the same thing was said. I, I don't know. It was our big warehouse. Somebody said that's where they're buried. They came that's back funny. and they buried them all up there in Torrance and Connecticut. I just I don't know. Hmm. We're gonna have to make a documentary about that too, huh, David? Yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah. like about big the gig. Atari. <laughs> yeah, the Atari ET cartridge. Has, uh, you, have you talked to uh, like Carlos or Margo? I'm 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 gonna I'm trying to cut track down Carlos, and I did talk to Margo uh, like two years ago. I'm gonna get her to come here and talk to the talk to the guys because she she tells really fascinating stories about the marketing portion, you know, and uh, f just figuring out the finer detail of. How big do you make the box? 
in order to fit you know a certain amount on a shelf right and you know the box has to have a certain amount you know it has to be uh eye-catchy enough and and she has some you know interesting thoughts about um some of the uh the early early marketing portion that you know you guys went to macy's and did this launch and there were other stores like that that wanted to be uh you know wanted to sell the, the 1000 but they didn't want to be competing with the drug stores right so they sort of they wanted this period of exclusivity or something and and that didn't happen and she thought that was not so good well she was in marketing she was the only one in marketing in the beginning she was the right. band's first marketing employee was margo and then i think it probably branched out yeah Margo yeah. usually was with me on commercial wherever there was a commercial there was margo even shot one at her house that's crazy lack lack of a better place there was a whole film crew there well, see now, now that's the thing that I have, we have to go ask her about. You know, is that, <laughs> she remembers that story. <laughs> I think she jumped ship before we went out of business. I'm not positive. I don't think she did. I, I think so. Yeah. I think she left. <clears throat> yeah, um, and I think I, I think I have managed. How about Lou Gailey? Did you ever get a hold of him? Um, um, I'm going to give you some names because if you can track them, Lou was the engineering vice president. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Uh, was a goat. Lou got it in my mind. So. Uh, uh, Bruno, on who's on here, has tracked Lou down and, and talked to him. You had, you had Victor, so Victor, Victor would probably tell you a good story because yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, he, was, he was in the engineering work. He worked for Lou. Okay. Now, Lou was a watch, the watch engineer. He, but vice presidents didn't give up titles easily. So when the the ROM people all reported to him too, anything to do with anything mechanical or hardware they they all burned him he was a nice guy but he, he was i think he was over overworked overstretched he had a lot on his plate and the build burning of that rom was that was a challenge yeah. Um, yeah i i fully take fully responsibility for the entire project of just the demise of the time x and Flair 1000 because i could <laughs> I could make it work, and if any of you gentlemen were there with me, we would have made it work, made it look easy, and the marketeers would have just jumped on it that much harder. But I made it work. If I did, if I never said you can't work this, this falls off, can't can't be done. Yeah, we, 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 George, I, I you, you've also mentioned a couple of times something that kind of confuses me, which is how I, I guess I understand how people had trouble with tapes, but like the Timex manual, like the one thousands manual is. It's really well written, and so is the one for the 2068. I mean, if I mean, I guess this is we have the same problem now with people not reading their manuals. So I guess I'm answering my own question. Like, if you don't read the manual, you can't use the product. And do you think that's what was happening? People just weren't reading the manual, or they're running through problems with the taper. What was the biggest well, I think issue? Because of the new product, you'd have to look at at least the first five or six pages of the manual to find how to hook it up. Mm -hmm. You know, and but beyond that, I don't know. I don't think I ever read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, Chuck well, I know wrote the manual. I'm pretty sure. I, I, I know it was a, a few weeks, a few months, months, weeks. I can't remember exactly when, but yes, Chuck's. Yeah, I know. Future. I know as a kid. That, go ahead. That uh, probably, <clears throat> if you were like me, you're struggling to afford this on the lowest end of the price spectrum of computers, you probably didn't have a quality cassette recorder. Yeah. Hello. We had a QC department and, and near the end, they checked everything. But well, I know Timex put out a list, you know, these are the approved tape recorders that we've tested. And I know for me as a child, I remember, you know, kind of listening to the tape first and making sure you know you didn't have it too loud because then it would distort right and it would sound kind of crappy and they, you had to have that you had to have the uh, treble <laughs> right if you had a tape recorder that was really like you said the azimuth was really off and you couldn't get those trebles uh you know and everything sounded just muddy well then you were never going to get it to load <laughs> no matter what you did and i could look at a thousand people and only one's going to have the same brain as you have and know i even understand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah true but, i just you know i mean i 
didn't know, but I just said, if I put a screwdriver in there and turn as I'm loading the tape, I didn't know it, physically what I was doing. I mean, Most. but this is where I think, yeah, but we couldn't. How could you go out to everybody who bought one and give them a private tutor lesson? Although I meant that there could have been people doing that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, most of the w way I did it was that, you know, I never <laughs> adjusted an azimuth on a tape head. And, you know, it was usually about the volume. And so with 81, at least, when you had, you turn up the volume on the TV a little bit, so you can hear the sound and you can see the black bars. And you knew you got a feel for how thick those bars should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Do you were getting a good, you had the volume right. And then it so would, would reliably load. I would ask you guys, was that how the other people did it? 